Well, Jesus loves you more than you can possibly imagine. He loves you so much that there's nothing you can do to make him love you less than he does right now. So there's nothing you can do to make him love you more than he loves you right now. And there are times when it's just information and we, we know it, we read it, somebody tells us, we might even sing it, it might hit our, hit our emotions, <clears throat> it might not hit our emotions, but singing, there's something special when we sing, when we're involved in worship. Uh, you know, there's one place, only one place in the New Testament that tells us how to be filled with the Spirit. It tells us to be filled with the Spirit, but in Ephesians, it tells us how. Speak to yourselves in psalms, that, that's in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Sometimes you've got to speak to yourself, sing to yourself. Preach to yourself. Say it out loud so you're not only saying it, you're hearing it, and it, it impacts. And the most transformative thing is when you know that God loves you. Um, and, and in times when things, the storms are rough, when times when, when uh, troubles are all around us, the times when we need miracles and they don't seem to be close to us, at those times, it is so important to realize that we, we have a God who loves us. I don't know if you've got any impossible prayers that you, you pray on a regular basis, prayers that you think seem impossible. Uh, I, I do, and I'm sure you do as well. Well, uh, I, I, I try this thing uh, often where what Jesus said to become like children. So I'm, I'm trying to picture myself as a little kid. And I'm, I'm in, in my mind, I'm, I'm climbing up onto the lap of my Heavenly Father. And I haven't climbed up in anybody's lap in quite a long time. So it, it takes some imagination. Oh, here's the point. If I'm a little kid up on the, up on the lap of, of, of my father, and like, like I got, got little grandkids, and, and uh, so, you know, they, they might come up on, on my lap occasionally. Well, at a time like that, if I can, if I can just imagine, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm up on the lap of my heavenly father, and I imagine his arms are wrapped around me. And uh, when, when we can imagine that, if you're a parent or a grandparent, then you know the feeling of having this little one, this, this, this one who can't do anything, they can't fix anything, they can't, they can't help you in any real way at all. And yet there they are, and they're just there to receive love. Well, something happens. And we recognize God, God is so much bigger. He can change everything. Actually, that's what the boat's about, if you're wondering. Now, if you're online, you probably can't see the boat. That's leading us to the series that we're on, obviously, and it is about overboard. It's about the story of Jesus walking on the water and Peter walking on the water, and there's so much for us to absorb, and we're going to get into that in, in a little while, but if ever there was a time when we can identify with this story, it's the days in which we're living. Storms are everywhere. Uh, you know, some of us feel like we're drowning and others of us are, are uh, kind of huddling close to other people whenever we can, very aware of the intensity of the storm around us. And Jesus is drawing close. And in fact, he's going to be calling us to do things we've never done before in terms of trusting him. And so we're, we're looking today uh, at, our, at our first installment, and, and that is about drawing close and being covered with dust, whatever that means. We'll get to that in a minute. Also, uh, to your right, uh, we've got the cross that was, that was uh, on, on the floor last week. I was so blessed uh, last week as people came up and they, they pinned little testimonies they had to the, to the cross. No one read them or anything like that, but, but it was a symbol. It was symbolic of the fact that every, every one of us has a story a testimony. We've, we've got a story to tell. And the stories that we tell are because of the decisions we've made to trust Jesus. The stories that we tell, though, all point to Jesus' story. And that's the finished work that he accomplished on the cross. So all of our stories point, point to the cross. You have a story, and God's working in your life. And it is so good to just remind ourselves, you are a trophy of the grace of God. 
we're going to jump uh, right in, so to speak, uh, pardon the pun, uh, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, let, it, let me read it for you. Uh, this story of Jesus walking on the water in the, in the storm is found in Mark chapter 6, it's also found in John cha- chapter 6, and here in Matthew 14. Immediately, he made the disciples, there's urgency here. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. As week goes on, weeks go on, we'll, we'll talk more about that, but the crowds are still there. Jesus tells the disciples to leave. Jesus by himself dismisses the crowds. He went up into the mountain himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. Okay, so what time of day is it? Well, we don't know exactly. It's still light out because the crowds have been leaving. Jesus goes up to pray. Then evening comes. So what, what time was it? Five, six, seven? Well, we don't know. We don't know. Let, let's, say, let's say it's like seven o'clock at night. Jesus was alone, but the boat was already over a mile from the land and has been battered by the waves because the wind was against them. And around three in the morning, (laughs) three in the morning. So how long have they been struggling out on the the, the water? Again, we don't know exactly, but if we... If we say it was late in the afternoon when they got in the boat, like, like even 7 o'clock, probably earlier, let's say it is 7 o'clock. It's now 3 in the morning. It's been 8 hours. They've been fighting 8 hours in this boat. Jesus came toward them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost. In other words, obviously they didn't recognize him. And they cried out in fear. And immediately Jesus spoke to them, Have courage, it's, it's me, it's, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter said, command me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Okay, that, that's so surprising. And climbing out of the boat... Peter started walking on the water, came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid. He began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Uh, Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him and said to him, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? See, I wish this was on videotape. How did Jesus say that? Did he say it like I read it? Oh, you have little faith. It's, it's, like, it's like when Martha and Mary were, were, were I, well, I should say Martha was serving supper to all the disciples. Mary was at the feet of Jesus. And Martha comes in and she says, Jesus, don't you care? Get my sister to help me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha. Like, I wish it was on videotape. How did that come across? Martha, Martha. Oh, you have little faith. Was it like that? Or was it Martha, Martha. I'm, I'm thinking with Peter, it's, oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? And we got into the boat. The wind ceased. Then those in the boat worshiped him and said, truly you are the son of God. Well, there is so much here to unpack. Today we're going to set the stage for, for the whole thing. Uh, set the stage. Well, we did set the stage with a boat. I'm not sure if their boat was like this boat. Probably not. I, can you see 12 guys sitting in that boat? I'm not sure. Uh, but it is a boat. One big step in the right direction for sure. Obviously, our focus goes to Jesus walking on the water and Peter stepping out of the boat. But I want to set the stage today and talk about something that's, that's kind of really different. But it explains a lot about this whole miracle to set it up. When we read Mark's gospel and John's gospel, we get information that we didn't get by just reading Matthew's account. We, we find out that there was a very significant event that happened before this miracle. And for some reason, the disciples forgot about that miracle to the point that when Mark tells the story, 
he reminds us before the miracle, something happened. And after the miracle, when Jesus steps in the boat, Mark tells us the reason why things happened like they happened was because they forgot about what had happened before the miracle. Okay, that, that, that's kind of fascinating. Why was Jesus in such a hurry? Why, 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 well, some say he was never in a hurry. Okay, why the urgency? Why to get them in the boat right away even before the crowds were dismissed? Jesus went to pray, sent them into a storm. Well, there's 12 disciples fighting a storm for eight hours or so. Unlike me, they're used to being on the water. Now, when I say that, I do have to mention, okay, yes, I'm not really used to being on the water, although I do have my boating license. Can I just, can I just mention that? Like, it, it took me hours to get online. And I got it because my son had, had rented a sea do and I wanted to ride the sea do And so when I was on the sea do the next day, after staying up till, yes, one o'clock in the morning, four hours worth of online stuff to get this silly license, I was fully licensed and I'm out of the sea do And I see a ship coming from the starboard and I see one coming. What's in the other direction, Luke? Port, yes, that was the right answer. Okay, and, and I see there's a green boy over here and there's a red boy over there. And I know, I know how to, I know where to go. And I'm thinking, okay, what I need to do is get out of everybody's way. So I don't know anything about being on the water, to be honest. The 12 guys in the boat, though, they were used to be on the water all the time. Four of them spent their entire lives on the water. Four of them, James and John, Peter and Andrew were fishermen. Whether they were fishermen or not, all of them had been on boats. All of them had been on this water. They'd all been in storms, no doubt, before. James, John, Peter, Andrew, four of them, one third of the crew, they were used to this. This wasn't new to them. All right, so regardless of how old the disciples were, some people postulize because of how long John lived that he, he could have been like 15 years old when he started to follow Jesus. He was working with his dad, Zebedee, in the boat business. He was probably a young guy. The others, we don't know how old they were. They weren't 50 or 60. They, they were younger men. We know Peter was married. Later on, Jesus heals his mother-in-law. So yes, he's married. Are the rest married? We don't know. We don't know a lot of the details. Probably they're a little bit younger, but here's, here's the point. Two things I want us to focus in on that may not seem important now, but we'll come back to it and we'll find that it is important. The one thing is they're used to being on the water. Four of them live on the water. That's their business. They know about storms. They've been in lots of storms. The second thing I want to point out, the four that I brought to our attention they are in a family business. James and John are brothers. Peter and Andrew are brothers. They're cousins. It may be a joint venture, but they're both in the family business. Peter and Andrew, we don't know for sure, but we get the idea from the story and from the scripture as much as we can that Peter and Andrew have taken over their family business and they're working on their own. James and John are working with their dad who is still, so they're in the process of taking over the family business. Interestingly, their dad's name is Zebedee, but James and John have nicknames. They're called Bonerge, sons of thunder. Now that can mean one of two things. Either James and John are kind of thunderous. Now James, we... I don't know that we ever hear from James. Later on, we find there is another James who leads the church in Jerusalem, but that's Jesus' brother. This is a different James. There's two. We, we never, I don't, I don't know that we've ever heard a peep out of this James, so it's not him. John, John's the disciple who Jesus loved. He's gentle. He's, he's, the, he's the younger one, likely, that leans up against the shoulders and against the chest of Jesus when dinner, uh, dinner time comes. So, you no, know, he's not known for being boisterous. So by default, it's the dad. The dad is thunderous. Son of thunder. He was, what does thunder mean? Well, thunder means he's a hothead and he's loud. Okay, so two things to remember. They're used to the water. They've been in storms. Second thing, the four that I'm talking about, they're all in their family business. Okay, we'll come back to that a little bit later because it's important. 
They're on the sea. Jesus comes back. Peter walks on the water. Let's leave them for a moment on the sea. Let's leave them uh, in the boat. And let's rewind a couple years. Between one and two years. Let's rewind to the first time Jesus came to those four guys. And they were, they were by the same boat, very likely. And Jesus is walking down the seashore. And there is Peter and Andrew... And they're either in the boat or by the boat, mending their nets or fishing. And there is James and John with their hot-headed dad, Zebedee, and they're fishing. And Jesus comes along, and something really strange happens. Jesus calls them, and this is what he says. As far as we know, he's never talked to them. He's never met them. They know about him. As they see him walking down the shore, Zebedee as well, he's never done a miracle yet. First miracle hasn't happened yet. But everybody knows him. Everybody knows he's a rabbi. Everybody knows he's actually the most famous rabbi in all of Israel. How how do we know that? Because we know, we're talking about Matthew chapter 4. We know the chapter before, Matthew 3, John the Baptist is preaching. He's knee deep in the Jordan River. He's baptizing people. And I bet the water's not as cold as our water was last week. Let me tell you that. Okay, I'm just saying, just saying. John the Baptist was not shivering in the Jordan River like some of us were. And by the way, God might have spoke to you yesterday that you need to take a next step of baptism. And let me encourage you, like, I don't know when it'll be, a couple months or whatever, we're going to have another baptism. We need, I think there's there's already one person that has expressed they want to be baptized. Yeah, like follow the Lord whatever way you can, and this is a great way. Okay, back to John the Baptist. As John the baptizer is doing his job, along comes Jesus. What we're told in Matthew chapter 3 is that all Jerusalem was there, and Judea was there, and people from Jordan were flocking there. Everybody was there. And John points to Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. He's going to take away the sins of the whole world. All right, okay, Jesus hasn't done a miracle yet. That doesn't happen until the wedding comes in Cana, but everybody knows him. He's the most popular, the most anticipated. John the Baptist has, has uh, announced his ministry's beginning, and along comes Jesus along the shore. He comes to Peter and Andrew, and this is all that he says, follow me. They drop what they're doing immediately, and they follow him. Then James and John with a hothead father. I don't, I don't know if you ever thought about this. I've thought about this. Okay, okay, here's the dad. His two boys are probably doing most of the work. Well, at least two thirds. Jesus says a couple things. All that he says to the boys, follow me. They drop their nets. They get out of the boat. They leave their dad, the hothead. Not a word. So interesting. Okay, we've left Jesus and the disciples uh, at the storm. Uh, We we rewound a couple years, and now uh, they're at the shore, and they dropped everything. Let's leave them too. Can we do it? Just leave them too. Oh, I just need to mention something else. Next week, next Sunday is special, right? It's part two of the series. Yes. Oh, yeah, there's something else. It's also the Super Bowl. Any Super Bowl fans? Bengal fans? L.A. Ram fans? Okay, well, believe it. Okay, hands down, hands down. I see see that hand. Okay, so I want to, I just want to mention something. And at, at first, you may not think there's, what is he doing wasting our time? I'd like to drop a comparison that's going to crystallize what had just happened in Matthew chapter 4 a little bit. Let me just say this. We talked about football and the NFL and the Super Bowl. There's over a million high school boys playing football, every one of them dreaming of a day that they might be in the NFL and in the Super Bowl. Of those million high school students playing football, 6% of them on average will make it to the NCAA, college ball. So we're talking... 
we're looking at 60,000 million boys, 6%. That's 60,000 of them will play college ball. Every one of those guys hoping against hope that they might make the NFL and the Super Bowl. Well, of that 60,000, 1% of college players make it to the Super Bowl. Okay, that's, that's like, of the million, 600 actually, sorry, not Super Bowl, to the NFL. 600, 1% of the 6% make it to the NFL. Now, according to the NFL Players Association, the, the average career length of a football player is three and a half seasons. Unless you're Tom Brady and it's 22 seasons, okay? Just retired. Three and a half seasons. Of the people who play in the NFL, on average, only 10% of them ever make it to the Super Bowl. So using the stats... A million high school kids, 60,000 college players, 600 of them only make it to the NFL, and then on average, 60 of them make it to the Super Bowl. Why do I say that? Because whoever's going to be playing next week are the best of the best. And by the way, since we're talking about Tom Brady, who just retired, 22 seasons, 10 seasons, he played in the Super Bowl. In the last eight years, he has played five times in the Super Bowl. This idea about best of the best. Okay, why, why am I mentioning that? I'll tell you in a second. Let me tell you one more story. I've started uh, Wednesday nights, uh, I have this doctor friend, lives in Texas, and uh, he and I do a podcast. No, it's not really a podcast. It's, a, it's an open Zoom call. Uh, so there's a guy who's always there. His name's Ted. Ted is an athlete. His sport of choice is golf. He is very close to being a, a pro-ranked. But he has a son playing high school football. I almost... I almost made a big mistake when he said that by saying I had a son who played high school football. Fortunately, I kept my mouth closed because Ted lives in, in Michigan. He's, he's in the States. And so as he's talking about his high school son playing football, he's laying out to me all of the football statistics that his son has accomplished. And he's talking about all the things his son can do. And he's talking about seeing his son being carried off the field and the injury. And I, I, my, my mind is being blown because he, he's thinking differently than I think. I think about my son. I think about my son playing football, and I'm sorry that he did because he got concussions that have affected him. He's playing about his son, and what he is thinking is his son may just end up in the NFL. And it, it was kind of a shocker, and it made me think, there's a lot of people that are going to be watching the game next week, and they're thinking about their sons, and they have in their mind this picture, if my son can only make it to the NFL, he will be a success. Now, hang on for a sec, just in case you may be looking down or thinking down a little bit about my friend Ted. Can we just be open and vulnerable here for a moment? Do you know that you have a mental map, a mental pathway to success too? And what about your kids? Do you have in your mind this, this pathway of what they need to do to be successful or happy or accomplished? Maybe your pathway is into the NFL, but you've got a pathway. When you're at home and it's nighttime and all of a sudden something happens and you hear this crack of, of uh, like the, the thunder and the lightning strike and, and, and the power goes out, you can't see anything. But as long as you know where you are in the house, even though it's dark, you can navigate your way around. Why? Because you, you got this little map and you're, you're, you're familiar with it. If I were to ask you whether, whether you're here right now in the service or whether you're online and I would say, 
uh, what's, what's the direction from your house to church? Or what's the direction from where you are right now to the nearest coffee shop or grocery store? Well, you'd be able to tell me uh, because you just kind of close your eyes and you think, well, you know, I just leave here. I go out. I turn right in the Allure Road. I gotta... how, how, how do you know these directions? The directions are in your head. We, we call it a mental map. You've got a mental map of success. Why, why is it that dads are so well known for wanting to push their kids into something that they wanted to do themselves or they did themselves, but now they want their kids to do it? I hate to say I'm not guilty of that. I did it. I st still do, actually. Okay, so why is that? Because sometimes our mental map of success, we weren't able to make it. Situations didn't pan out. Finances didn't pan out. Maybe we were disqualified. We weren't good enough. And so we hope and we dream beyond dreams that our kids will take the same pathway we wish we could have taken. All right, so why am I talking about this? Why am I talking about the best of the best and my friend Ted and fathers pushing their sons to things they wish they could have done? Because when we go back to this story in Matthew chapter 4, which is going to lead us to this story in Matthew 14, when Jesus comes up to his disciples, disciples-to-be, something was going on that we, we don't really appreciate. We all have mental maps of success. I'm not sure if anybody here is pushing your son to be in the NFL. I, I don't know. That, I don't know. You're probably dreaming something for your kids. In first century Israel, in this culture that was totally woven around the centricity of God and the love for God's word, the Torah, fathers dreamt, not that their kids would be in the NFL. That's not going to happen for 1,900 years. It was like the turn of the century. First American football game wasn't like 1920 or something like that. So what, what were they dreaming of? What was, what was their aspiration? It has to do with your culture. It has to do with your values. It has to do with your, your background, your family of origin. For them, everything was about God. It was circled around the love for God's word, the studying of the Torah. All of the little boys in this patriarchal society, sorry, all the stories are about boys. But girls, may I just mention that Jesus came on the scene and elevated women to a place that was, it was actually earth-shaking to his culture. To the point where the apostles said in Christ, in fact, there is, no, there is no man or woman. Everybody's the same in Christ. Okay, Jesus brought that on the scene. But he grew up in this culture that was, that was patriarchal. And the boys from a very young age would be sent off to the synagogue to memorize the Torah, to learn the law. And all of the fathers had a mental map in their mind. And what they were hoping is that someday their little boy would be good enough to become a rabbi, a teacher of the Torah. That was the pinnacle, the apex of the dreams of all fathers in that culture. That, that was their value. That was what their life was based on. That's where they found their, their identification. And it wasn't anybody. You could not bring your application to a rabbi and say, I want, I want to be one of your disciples. It didn't work that way. It's like the NFL draft. For the draft, you, you've got 60,000 college students that want to get in the NFL. They, they don't go to the teams. The teams choose them. The teams draft them. Tom Brady was seventh round in the draft, by the way. And there's a lot of people that don't make it. There's 60,000 want to get in. Only 1% get in. What about all the people that don't make it? It's too bad. You don't make it. You don't qualify. You're not good enough. That's just the way it is. You're not good enough for this level. You're not the best. And so when a rabbi would go from synagogue to synagogue to little town to little town and he'd question all the little boys and he'd question their knowledge of the Torah and Jesus at 12 years old was in the temple asking questions of the leaders because he was the best of the best of the best of the best. 
Rabbis go around to synagogues and then they ask questions and they look and they find and they, and they try to find who's the best, who's the best. And then they call them. And when they call this, this young boy, pro, like a young boy, probably just an early teen, not a late adolescent, probably a very young teen, just old enough to leave home. He says, follow me. And then the kid leaves. They talk about it like this in rabbinical literature. The boy leaves his old life and he comes and he follows his rabbi into his new life. And everybody who's around, and they see the call of the rabbi, and someone follow him, rabbinical literature says they always give a blessing to that little boy. And they say to him, may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered with the dust of of your rabbi. What in the world? What happened was these boys, their whole mission now was to get as close to the rabbi as they could. And so the dust from the rabbi's sandals on the road would get onto them because they were close. The blessing of maybe covered with the dust of your rabbi was a blessing that means may you actually get as close as you can to your rabbi, to your teacher. And from that point on, it was all about to get close. We don't have anything like this in our culture. As I was thinking about it, the only thing that just gives us a little glimpse of this concept is in the trades. When, when people become apprentices. When a person becomes an apprentice, he hooks up to some master of the trade. Let's say it's an electrician. So he, he finds a master electrician and they'll take him on. And now he's got to go to school for a certain amount of time. He's got to log in like thousands of hours of practical work until he qualifies. Then he'll take exams and then he'll be the same thing that the master electrician was, hopefully. It pales in comparison, though, to following a rabbi because that was 24-7. It's not that they would never go home, but... It would be to fill up on supplies maybe, but they, they spent day and night and, and they learned everything that the rabbi knew so that they could teach it later. They not only took what he knew, they followed his habits, his lifestyle, the things they, they, they were looking for things that he did that they could copy. It was all about becoming, becoming like him. Whatever he did, they do. Jesus sent out his disciples two on two, he gave them the power to do miracles. Everything that he did, he wanted them to do. Rabbinical literature uses this phrase. The young man takes on the yoke of the rabbi. What does that mean? The yoke of the rabbi, that means the harness. He's harnessed to the rabbi. He's, he's taken on everything that rabbi is. He's taken it all on. What he says, how he talks, what he knows, what he thinks, his mannerisms, his lifestyle, the rhythms of his living, everything he takes it on. When Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, to take his yoke on, it wasn't just so you won't be tired. What he's saying is live like an apprentice to me. Okay, back to the story. Kind of tying it all together in the next couple minutes. James and John, Peter and Andrew were working with their father. When a rabbi would come and choose someone to be his follower, the people would bless the boy by saying, as I mentioned a few times, may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. What about all the people that didn't make it? All the little boys that didn't make it, all the families, the fathers are disappointed. Well, again, rabbinical literature is, is pretty clear. And this is what the rabbi would say. The rabbi would say, go back home, ply your trade, get a family and pray that your son will be a rabbi. Go back home, ply your trade, get a family, pray that your son will be a rabbi. And so we have James and John are with their hot-headed dad, Zebedee. Peter and Andrew are by themselves. They're all on the same shore. Along comes Jesus. Everybody knows who Jesus is. The boys, they're not young teenagers they're older. 
Except maybe John, 15. We don't know. They're all older. We know Peter's, Peter's already married. Maybe the rest are too. They've already gone back home. They're already plying their trade. They're, they're already preparing to take over the family business. Why? Because they weren't good enough. As young boys, they were not good enough to, to follow a rabbi. And here's Zebedee. He's got a family business. He was never good enough either. And he started his own fishing business. Dreaming, dreaming, having this mental map that maybe someday his boys would be rabbis, but they weren't good enough to make the cut. They didn't make the draft. So they came back to work for their dad. And along comes the most famous rabbi in the country and he stops in front of them and he says to them follow me and Zebedee is thinking what am I hearing what are you kidding me you kids get out of the boat get out of the boat before he changes his mind what are you doing why are you so slow get out of the boat oh he's not angry his dreams have come true. Peter and Andrew, James and John, they cannot believe what Jesus just said. Because they've been disqualified. They weren't good enough. They didn't make the draft. They didn't make the cut. But Jesus, Jesus was the best of the best of the best. He said, follow me. Take my yoke. And from that point on, it was all about getting close to Jesus. Doing everything that Jesus did. Their heart should be to do everything that Jesus did. Now what about you? What about me? When you are called, it, it, it's just a way different than we think in our culture. This is all consuming. This, this is everything. This is everything on the line. This is leaving the past the old life and coming to a new one. This is all about 100% getting close to Jesus. Make, makes me understand. Scripture's a little bit better. Ephesians chapter five. Watch what God does and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Draw close to God and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love wasn't cautious. It was extravagant. He didn't love us to get something from us. He, he loved in order to give something, everything of himself to us. Love like that. The days in which we live are days to be apprentices of Jesus. And when the waves and the storms and all of that is around us, the first thing we have to remember, the very first thing is we need to draw close to Jesus first. That's the first order of business. With a mission to express the unconditional love of Jesus to everyone and a vision of, of growing in our trust for Jesus and our love of people and bringing hope to everyone in our community. With, with that in mind, here's what, here's what we do. Whether it's as an individual or whether it's a, is it as a church, the first thing, the first order of business to draw close to Jesus, to let his dust cover us? Do you know what I mean? To think like Jesus thinks. To change our mental maps. What is important? As a Jesus follower, what's important is how you think. If you and I have the idea that security comes from money, then when we get his yoke on us and we draw close, his Holy Spirit will prompt us. Don't lay up for yourselves money on earth, treasures where it, 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 it can decay, it can be stolen, it can devalue, so much can change to, but, but don't, don't worry about, lay, lay up for yourself treasures in, in heaven. Build, build your life on what can't be taken away from you. What Jesus is saying is change the mental map of what success means. And as we do and draw close to Jesus, everything changes in our lives. Let's stand together and pray. And whether, uh, if you're at home, I'm thinking you may not stand where you are. I'm not exactly sure. 
but let's, let's, let's pray and let God do something in our hearts and minds. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you. You've called us to be your disciples. It means so much more than we thought. We're yoked with you, Jesus. And it's not because we're good enough. We did not deserve to make the cut. We were disqualified. But you qualified yourself and then you called us because you are the best of the best of the best. And Lord, we're, we're in you. It's all about you. It all comes back to you again. And so Lord, would you help us in our mission to express your unconditional love to everyone as we go forward in life, growing in our trust, growing in our love and, and bringing hope to people around us. That comes by drawing close to you, Jesus allowing you to change our thinking. Commit it to you. In your name we pray and everybody said amen. Well, thank you so much if you joined us online. Have a great week. And uh, don't forget, next week is special because it's part two of Overboard. Thank you.